Hello, I'm Safa Fanayan, a third year PhD student at the University of Oxford, studying at the School of Geography and Environment. I'm researching governance of water risks of growing riverine cities, and my case study is Gohati City and its rivers. I think this issue of urban rivers is an important area to study because it is predicted that many of these smaller cities will grow. And in this bargain of urban growth, urban rivers get lost and become polluted. And this change of urban rivers and this loss of urban rivers causes a whole set of problems that impact urban dwellers, and specifically those living in informal settlements and the marginalized ones even more, and not to mention the biodiversity that gets lost. Hi, my name is Vansha Chen, and I'm an Indra Gandhi scholar. Um, the focus of my research is studying the impact of sea level rise on maritime boundaries. The current framework we have to deal with jurisdiction on the oceans depends on something called the baseline, which is a mathematical approximation of where a country's coast lies. And all jurisdiction of the oceans is hinges on distance from that baseline. The problem with this setup is that sea level rise renders coastlines unstable and causes boundaries um, that are set up under this current system to fluctuate and to move around. The purpose of my research is to find a way in existing law to stabilize the movement of these borders, or at least to reduce the movement of these borders as far as possible. The reason why this research is important, particularly for a country like India, is because India has already been engaged in litigation um, against neighboring states such as Bangladesh and Myanmar because of this fluctuation of the baseline. Um, both Bangladesh and India are countries that are likely to face strong impacts, strong effects of sea level rise. And that is going to have a permanent impact on the coast, which is why having methods in place to stabilize the baseline and to predict with accuracy where the boundary lies, for instance, in the Bay of Bengal, is extremely important to predict with accuracy which state can access oil reserves in that bay um, and which state can authorize fishing in that bay. And having that sort of predictability in international law is ultimately what the goal of my research is. Thank you. My name is Trisha Gopalakrishna and I'm a DPhil candidate in the School of Geography and the Environment and one of the Oxford Indira Gandhi Scholars for 2019. My doctoral research aims to examine the opportunities and realities of forest restoration in India for climate change mitigation. By forest restoration, I mean a wide variety of tools and methodologies that could restore forests. This could include the planting of native tree saplings and allowing them to grow over large areas and long periods of time weed removal to allow degraded forests to grow and mature, as well as soil preparation to allow existing forests to continue to grow and mature. My doctoral research aims to address three main questions. One, where are the opportune areas available for forest restoration in India? And what is the mitigation potential that could be achieved on restoring these areas to forests? Two, are these areas of opportunity for forest restoration actually able to sustain forests or are they meant to sustain non-forest ecosystems such as India's savannas, which also provide a wide range of economic and ecosystem services? Third, apart from climate change mitigation benefits, are there any other ecosystem benefits such as habitat for biodiversity as well as improved water supply that could be produced on restoring large areas of land back to forests in India? Hi, I'm Avika. I'm a second year GPhil zoology candidate. I'm studying the effects of climate change and land use land cover change on forest parts of eastern Indian Himalaya, which is also a global biodiversity hotspot. Rising temperatures, rainfall fluctuating patterns, along with land use land cover changes, are likely to affect several forest bird species of the tropics. While many birds are expected to learn how to cope with these changes, many birds with highly selective needs might not be able to adjust at all. With the help of prediction mathematical models and field data, I'm assessing which birds of this region are at immediate threat due to these events. In my third academic year, 
I will also be conducting a focus study in the easternmost Indian Himalayan state, Arunachal Pradesh. Arunachal is predominantly inhabited by several indigenous communities who live in close proximity to the forests. I will quantify how local land use regulations and changes are altering bird distributions in this region. I am also incorporating knowledge of an indigenous community to investigate if they perceive climate change and forest degradation as having any effect on the local bird population. Hi, I'm Sangamitra Mukherjee and I'm a DFIL candidate in the Department of Economics. I'm an Indira Gandhi scholar funded by the Oxford India Centre. Uh, today I will talk to you a little about my research. I'm an applied microeconomist and my research looks at the constraints to the growth of small firms in developing countries. Specifically, I look at the role of financial and managerial constraints to the growth of women-led microenterprises. Uh, today I'll talk to you about one of my studies where I look at easing a financial constraint by uh, analyzing the impact of an innovative financial contract that I call a micro equity contract amongst um, women led micro enterprises in the state of Karnataka. Um, so to give you uh, some context, um, about 98% of the businesses in India are micro enterprises and lack access to sufficient capital and are quite susceptible to income shocks. As a result of this, they, uh, you know, it really constrains their growth potential and profitability. And though these small businesses do quite often have access to um, microcredit contracts, the repayments for microcredit contracts are often quite rigid, which limits entrepreneurs from being able to undertake high-risk, high-return investments. And these constraints are even more severe for women micro uh, entrepreneurs. Um, what we offer in a micro-equity contract is a flexible repayment schedule. That is, the repayments are revenue contingent. On months that entrepreneurs do well, they repay a larger amount. And on months that they do badly, they repay a substantially smaller amount. Um, this, this flexibility in repayment and implicit insurance against risks, we believe will um, help businesses grow. Uh, so the primary research question I ask is, do micro equity contracts spur growth amongst micro entrepreneurs beyond what is seen in micro credit? We hypothesize that, yes, this is indeed the case. The method I use for my research is I'm, uh, I, off, I randomize access to these contracts to a treatment group, and by comparing them to a control group, I'm able to quantitatively assess the impact of these contracts. I'm Divya, doing my DPhil in Biochemistry Department at Oxford. I'm working on tackling antimicrobial resistance through the development of novel techniques and faster diagnosis tools. What is worrying about AMR is that it's like a slow tsunami whose effects are not feeble right now, but if not curbed in time, would lead to a pandemic way worse than COVID-19. WHO predicted by 2050, AMR would be causing the largest number of deaths and also costing more than 66 trillion pounds. It's a really key problem because the issue is known for quite some time, but it still is unresolved. For tackling the issue, I'm working in a lab with people from various fields, including engineering, physics, and microbiology. With experiments done over time, we know antibiotics don't kill all the cells. But what's striking is that it is still unknown that antibiotics that have been in use for more than 100 years now, how do they kill the bacteria and how does the resistance develop in them? So by creating new antibiotics, you're not really solving the issue, but making bacteria more and more powerful. So what my aim here is to understand what is the key cause of the resistance development and death, even at a very single cell level, to understand which cell is able to survive and how it does that. And that's the main question my DFIL project is aiming at. I'm Aradna, a second year DFIL candidate in law being supervised by Professor Laura Hayano. I'm a Gopal Subramaniam scholar at OICSD. My research focuses on analyzing how rape laws are adjudicated in the Indian courtroom. In December 2012, a 23-year-old woman was brutally gang raped and tortured in a bus in Delhi. This incident generated widespread international and national media coverage and was widely condemned. It also sparked a sorely needed debate in India on the issues of consent and rape law. Post this, the criminal law got amended in 2013. 
this 2013 amendment brought significant changes to substantive and procedural laws pertaining to rape. But does changing the law on paper mean that the law has changed in the courtroom? My research seeks to find out if the 2013 amendment is being in implemented in the courtroom. Have the courts managed to shift the legal narrative of the judicial discourse on rape to respecting women's sexual autonomy and bodily integrity and having a robust discussion on consent? Or does it continue to be seeped in patriarchal stereotypes? And if it continues to be seeped in patriarchal stereotypes, what can be done to improve the manner in which the judges interpret and apply the 2013 legislation? An inquiry of this kind has not been conducted in India before, and I hope that my thesis will make a substantial contribution to the rape jurisprudence in India. Thank you.